is a protest video. This is about us taking back our city from two political hacks, Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio. This is not their city. This is the city of over 8 million New Yorkers who live and work here and all those who visit here from all over the world. It's time we stop hiding like cowards from COVID-19. COVID-19 is a danger. It's not the end of the world. It's under control. And unlike everywhere else in the United States, New York City is shut down for no reason except for the fact that Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio are asserting powers, illegal, unconstitutional powers, which they have no right to. The narrative for this video is supplied from the text by one of the most famous books, a very long essay written about New York 70 years ago in 1949 by the noted acclaimed writer E.B. White titled Here is New York. Here's how John Updike described this book. Just to dip into this miraculous essay to experience the wonderful lightness and momentum of its prose, its supremely casual air and surprisingly tight knit is to find oneself going ahead and rereading it all. White's homage feels as fresh today as it did so many years ago. The reader will find certain observations to be no longer true of the city, owing to the passage of time and the swing of the pendulum. The essential fever of New York has not changed in any particular. To bring New York down to date, a man would have to be published with the speed of light. New York is not a capital city. It is not a national capital or a state capital. But it is by way of becoming the capital of the world. The buildings, as conceived by architects, will be cigar boxes set on end. Traffic will flow in a new tunnel under First Avenue. Once again, the city will absorb, almost without showing any sign of it, a congress of visitors. The city, at last, perfectly illustrates both the universal dilemma and the general solution. This riddle in steel and stone is at once the perfect target and the perfect demonstration of nonviolence, of racial brotherhood, this lofty target scraping the skies and meeting the destroying plains halfway, home of all people and all nations, capital of everything. A block or two west of the new city of man in Turtle Bay, there is an old willow tree that presides over an interior garden. It is a battered tree, long-suffering and much climbed, held together by strands of wire but beloved of those who know it. In a way, it symbolizes the city, life under difficulties, growth against odds, sap rise in the midst of concrete, and the steady reaching for the sun. Whenever I look at it nowadays and feel the cold shadow of the plains, I think, this must be saved, this particular thing, this very tree. If it were to go, all would go. This city, this mischievous and marvelous monument, which not to look upon would be like death. The subterranean system of telephone cables, power lines, steam pipes, gas mains, and sewer pipes is reason enough to abandon the island to the gods and the weevils. Every time an incision is made in the pavement, the noisy surgeons expose ganglia that are tangled beyond belief. By rights, New York should have destroyed itself long ago, from panic, or fire, or rioting, or failure of some vital supply line in its circulatory system, or from some deep labyrinthine short circuit. Long ago, the city should have experienced an insoluble traffic snarl at some impossible bottleneck. It should have perished of hunger when food lines failed for a few days. It should have been wiped out by a plague starting in its slums or carried in by ship's rats. It should have been overwhelmed by the sea that licks at it on every side. The workers in its myriad cells should have succumbed to nerves on the fearful pall of smoke fog that drifts over every few days from Jersey, blotting out all light at noon 
and leaving the high offices suspended, men groping and depressed, and the sense of world's end. It should have been touched in the head by the August heat, and gone off its rocker. Mass hysteria is a terrible force, yet New Yorkers seem always to escape it by some tiny margin. They sit in stalled subways without claustrophobia. They extricate themselves from panic situations by some lucky wisecrack. They meet confusion and congestion with patience and grit. A sort of perpetual muddling through. Every facility is inadequate. The hospitals and schools and playgrounds are overcrowded. The express highways are feverish. The unimproved highways and bridges are bottlenecks. There is not enough air and not enough light. And there is usually either too much heat or too little. But the city makes up for its hazards and its deficiencies by supplying its citizens with massive doses of a supplementary vitamin. The sense of belonging to something unique, cosmopolitan, mighty, and unparalleled. The city is literally a composite of tens of thousands of tiny neighborhood units. There are, of course, the big districts and big units, Chelsea and Murray Hill and Gramercy, which are residential units, Harlem, a racial unit, Greenwich Village, a unit dedicated to the arts and other matters, and there is Radio City, a commercial development, Peter Cooper Village, a housing unit, the Medical Center, a sickness unit, and many other sections, each of which has some distinguishing characteristic. But the curious thing about New York is that each large geographical unit is composed of countless small neighborhoods. Each neighborhood is virtually self-sufficient. Usually it is no more than two or three blocks long and a couple of blocks wide. Each area is a city within a city within a city. Thus, no matter where you live in New York, you will find within a block or two a grocery store, a barber shop, a newsstand and shoeshine shack, an ice coal and wood cellar, where you write your order on a pad outside as you walk by, a dry cleaner, a laundry, a delicatessen, beer and sandwiches delivered at any hour to your door, a flower shop, an undertaker's parlor, a movie house, a radio repair shop, a stationer, a haberdasher, a tailor, a drugstore, a garage, a tea room, a saloon, a hardware store, a liquor store, a shoe repair shop. Every block or two in most residential sections of New York is a little main street. So complete is each neighborhood and so strong the sense of neighborhood that many a New Yorker spends a lifetime within the confines of an area smaller than a country village. Let him walk two blocks from his corner and he is in a strange land and will feel uneasy till he gets back. Storekeepers are particularly conscious of neighborhood boundary lines. A woman friend of mine moved recently from one apartment to another a distance of three blocks. When she turned up the day after the move at the same grocers that she had patronized for years, the proprietor was in ecstasy, almost in tears, at seeing her. I was afraid, he said, that now you've moved away I wouldn't be seeing you anymore. To him, away was three blocks. The collision and the intermingling of these millions of foreign-born people representing so many races and creeds make New York a permanent exhibit of the phenomenon of one world. The citizens of New York are tolerant not only from disposition, but from necessity. The city has to be tolerant, otherwise it would explode in a radioactive cloud of hate and rancor and bigotry. If the people were to depart even briefly from the peace of cosmopolitan intercourse, the town would blow up higher than a kite. In New York smolders every race problem there is, but the noticeable thing is not the problem, but the inviolate truce. I feel that it is the readers, not the authors, duty to bring New York down to date and I trust it will prove less a duty than a pleasure. EBW. Here is New York. On any person who desires such queer prizes, New York will bestow the gift of loneliness and the gift of privacy. It is this largesse that accounts for the presence within the city's walls of a considerable section of the population. For the residents of Manhattan are to a large extent strangers who have pulled up stakes somewhere and come to town, seeking sanctuary or fulfillment, or some greater or lesser grail. The capacity to make such dubious gifts is a mysterious quality of New York. It can destroy an individual, or it can fulfill him, 
depending a good deal on luck. No one should come to New York to live unless he is willing to be lucky. New York is the concentrate of art and commerce and sport and religion and entertainment and finance, bringing to a single compact arena the gladiator, the evangelist, the promoter, the actor, the trader, and the merchant. It carries on its lapel the unexpungible odor of the long past, so that no matter where you sit in New York, you feel the vibrations of great times and tall deeds, of queer people and events and undertakings. I am twenty-two blocks from where Rudolph Valentino lay in state, eight blocks from where Nathan Hale was executed, five blocks from the publisher's office where Ernest Hemingway hit Max Eastman on the nose, four miles from where Walt Whitman sat sweating out editorials for the Brooklyn Eagle, thirty-four blocks from the street Willa Cather lived in when she came to New York to write books about Nebraska, one block from where Marceline used to clown on the boards of the Hippodrome, thirty-six blocks from the spot where the historian Joe Gould kicked a radio to pieces in full view of the public, thirteen blocks from where Harry Thaw shot Stanford White, five blocks from where I used to usher at the Metropolitan Opera, and only a hundred and twelve blocks from the spot where Clarence Day the Elder was washed of his sins in the Church of the Epiphany. I am probably occupying the very room that any number of exalted and somewise memorable characters sat in, some of them on hot, breathless afternoons, lonely and private, and full of their own sense of emanations from without. I am told this is the greatest seaport in the world, with 650 miles of waterfront, and ships calling here from many exotic lands. But the only boat I've happened to notice since my arrival was a small sloop tacking out of the East River night before last on the ebb tide while I was walking across the Brooklyn Bridge. I heard the Queen Mary blow one midnight, though, and the sound carried the whole history of departure and longing and loss. At the ball grounds and horse parks, the greatest sporting spectacles have been enacted. I saw no ball player, no racehorse. The governor came to town. I heard the sirens scream, but that was all there was to that. An 18-inch margin again. But New York is peculiarly constructed to absorb almost anything that comes along, whether a thousand-foot liner out of the east or a 20,000-man convention out of the west, without inflicting the event on its inhabitants so that every event is, in a sense, optional, and the inhabitant is in the happy position of being able to choose his spectacle and so conserve his soul. In most metropolises, small and large, the choice is often not with the individual at all. He is thrown to the lions. The lions are overwhelming. The event is unavoidable. A cornice falls, and it hits every citizen on the head, every last man in town. I sometimes think, that the only event that hits every New Yorker on the head is the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is fairly penetrating. The quality in New York that insulates its inhabitants from life may simply weaken them as individuals. Perhaps it is healthier to live in a community where, when a cornice falls, you feel the blow, where, when the governor passes, you see at any rate his hat. I'm not defending New York in this regard. Many of its settlers are probably here merely to escape not face reality. But whatever it means, it is a rather rare gift, and I believe it has a positive effect on the creative capacities of New Yorkers. For creation is, in part, merely the business of foregoing the great and small distractions. Although New York often imparts a feeling of great forlornness or forsakenness, it seldom seems dead or unresourceful and you always feel that either by shifting your location ten blocks or by reducing your fortune by five dollars you can experience rejuvenation. Many people who have no real independence of spirit depend on the city's tremendous variety and sources of excitement for spiritual sustenance and maintenance of morale. In the country there are few chances of sudden rejuvenation, a shift in weather perhaps, or something arriving in the mail. But in New York, the chances are endless. I think that, although many persons are here from some excess of spirit, which caused them to break away from their small town, some, too, are here from a deficiency of spirit, who find in New York a protection or an easy substitution. There are roughly three New Yorks. 
There is, first, the New York of the man or woman who was born here, who takes the city for granted and accepts its size and its turbulence as natural and inevitable. Second, there is the New York of the commuter, the city that is devoured by locusts each day and spat out each night. Third, there is the New York of the person who was born somewhere else and came to New York in quest of something. Of these three trembling cities, the greatest is the last, the city of final destination, the city that is a goal. It is this third city that accounts for New York's high-strung disposition, its poetical deportment, its dedication to the arts, and its incomparable achievements. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness, natives give it solidity and continuity, but the settlers give it passion. And whether it is a farmer arriving from Italy to set up a small grocery store in a slum, or a young girl arriving from a small town in Mississippi to escape the indignity of being observed by her neighbors, or a boy arriving from the Corn Belt with a manuscript in his suitcase and a pain in his heart, it makes no difference. Each embraces New York with the intense excitement of first love. Each absorbs New York with the fresh eyes of an adventurer. Each generates heat and light to dwarf the consolidated Edison Company. The commuter is the queerest bird of all. The suburb he inhabits has no essential vitality of its own and is a mere roost where he comes at day's end to go to sleep. Except in rare cases, the man who lives in the Maranek or Little Neck or Teaneck and works in New York discovers nothing much about the city except the time of arrival and departure of trains and buses and the path to a quick lunch. He is desk-bound and has never, idly roaming in the gloaming, stumbled suddenly on Belvedere Tower in the park, seen the ramparts rise sheer from the water of the pond, and the boys along the shore fishing for minnows, girls stretched out negligently on the shelves of the rocks. He has never come suddenly on anything at all in New York as a loiterer, because he has had no time between trains. He has fished in Manhattan's wallet and dug out coins, but has never listened to Manhattan's breathing, never awakened to its morning, never dropped off to sleep in its night. About 400,000 men and women come charging onto the island each weekday morning, out of the mouths of tubes and tunnels. Not many among them have ever spent a drowsy afternoon in the great rustling oaken silence of the reading room of the public library, with the book elevator, like an old water wheel, spewing out books onto the trays. They tend their furnaces in Westchester and in Jersey, but have never seen the furnaces of the Bowery, the fires that burn in oil drums on zero winter nights. They may work in the financial district downtown and never see the extravagant plantings of Rockefeller Center, the daffodils and grape hyacinths and birches, and the flags trimmed to the wind on a fine morning in spring. Or they may work in a midtown office and may let a whole year swing round without sighting Governor's Island from the seawall. The commuter dies with tremendous mileage to his credit, but he is no rover. His entrances and exits are more devious than those in a prairie dog village, and he calmly plays bridge while buried in the mud at the bottom of the East River. The Long Island Railroad alone carried 40 million commuters last year, but many of them were the same fellow retracing his steps. The terrain of New York is such that a resident sometimes travels farther in the end than a commuter. Irving Berlin's journey from Cherry Street in the Lower East Side to an apartment uptown was through an alley and was only three or four miles in length, but it was like going three times around the world. The city is like poetry. It compresses all life, all races and breeds, into a small island and adds music and the accompaniment of internal engines. The island of Manhattan is without any doubt the greatest human concentrate on Earth, the poem whose magic is comprehensible to millions of permanent residents, but whose full meaning will always remain elusive. At the feet of the tallest and plushiest offices lie the crummiest slums. The genteel mysteries housed in the Riverside Church are only a few blocks from the voodoo charms of Harlem. The merchant princes, riding to Wall Street in their limousines down the East River Drive, pass within a few hundred yards of the Gypsy Kings. But the princes do not know they are passing kings, and the kings are not up yet anyway. 
They live a more leisurely life than the princes and get drunk more consistently. New York is nothing like Paris. It is nothing like London. And it is not Spokane multiplied by 60 or Detroit multiplied by 4. It is by all odds the loftiest of cities. It even managed to reach the highest point in the sky at the lowest moment of the Depression. The Empire State Building shot 1,250 feet into the air when it was madness to put out as much as six inches of new growth. The building has a mooring mast that no dirigible has ever tied to. It employs a man to flush toilets in slack times. It has been hit by an airplane in a fog, struck countless times by lightning, and been jumped off of by so many unhappy people that pedestrians instinctively quicken step when passing 5th Avenue and 34th Street. Manhattan has been compelled to expand skyward because of the absence of any other direction in which to grow. This, more than any other thing, is responsible for its physical majesty. It is to the nation what the white church spire is to the village, the visible symbol of aspiration and faith, the white plume saying that the way is up. The summer traveler swings in over Hellgate Bridge and from the window of his sleeping car as it glides above the pigeon lofts and backyards of Queens, looks southwest to where the morning light first strikes the steel peaks of Midtown, and he sees its upward thrust unmistakable. The great walls and towers rising, the smoke rising, the heat not yet rising, the hopes and ferments of so many awakening millions rising, this vigorous spear that presses heaven hard. New York never quite catches up with itself, is never in equilibrium. In flush times, the population mushrooms and the new dwellings sprout from the rock. Come bad times, and the population scatters and the lofts are abandoned, and the landlord withers and dies. New York has changed in tempo and in temper during the years I have known it. There is greater tension, increased irritability, you encounter it in many places, in many faces. The normal frustrations of modern life are here multiplied and amplified. New York is not a capital city. It is not a national capital or a state capital. But it is by way of becoming the capital of the world. The buildings, as conceived by architects, once again, the city will absorb, almost without showing any sign of it, a congress of visitors. The city, at last, perfectly illustrates both the universal dilemma and the general solution. This riddle in steel and stone is at once the perfect target and the perfect demonstration of nonviolence, of racial brotherhood. This lofty target scraping the skies and meeting the destroying planes halfway, home of all people and all nations, capital of everything. Our city is great. It needs to be great again. It isn't going to be a city and should not be a city of people in mass for the next year, of people hesitant to come into New York to work or to go to restaurants or to go to the theaters. It's time to start rapidly reopening the city so that by the end of the summer, if not sooner, New York City is back to where it was, and in fact better than before, 
and more ambitious and more attractive than ever before. Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio go to hell.